We're going to come out of Daniel chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. Daniel chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. Y'all got y'all. If y'all have it, somebody say, I got it. If you don't have it, just say, I'm looking at the screen. Say, I'm going to look at the screen. Say, I'm a, I'm, I'm a new generation of Christian. Amen. So we're going to read that right quick. All right. Y'all got it? All right. That's who we was waiting for. All right. We're going to read it out of the King James Version tonight. I might go into the New King James later, but let's read it out of the King James Version. Um, I forgot my Bible in my office, so I'm depending on them screens tonight. All right. There we go. All right. Here we go. The Bible says... It pleased Darius. What Darius is it? Oh, <laughs> no, it's a flame. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom and 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom. Verse 2. And over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first, that the princes might give accounts to, unto them, and the king should have no damage. Verse 3. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because of an excellent spirit was in him. Somebody said an excellent spirit. An excellent spirit. Was in him. And the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Verse 4. Then the presidents and the princes sought to find occasions against uh, accusations against him, against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find no accusation. Nor fault far as much as he was faithful. I need my glasses. Yeah, y'all. It's behind me. Oh, yeah, there we go. Faithful. Neither was there any error or fault found in him. Verse 5. Then said these men, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Bring me back to verse 3. In the New King James Version, it says, Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and set traps because of an excellent spirit was in him. Amen. Give God some praise for his word. <laughs> Hallelujah. Tonight, I want to talk from the title of Breaking the Mold. Somebody say, Breaking the Mold. But at, at the same time, I want you to ask your neighbor, on the side of you, since that's your praise partner, y'all, 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 y'all know each other, right? Ask him, say, do you have an excellent spirit? It's just something, it's just something to think about. I'm gonna start off with that question. And at the end of my sermon, I'm gonna ask y'all that same question. All right? Praise God. Hallelujah. God, we just thank you for this word. We pray that this word speak to our hearts, speak to us, Lord God, so that we can grow be better to be more like you, God. We make ourselves available right now for whatever you have for us, God. Challenge us, rebuke us. God, we want it. We are here because we want to be better. We want to grow and we want to uh, uh, go to the next level in our walk. So God, speak to our hearts. Uh, um, let your presence be in this place and uh, reveal to us a side of us, God, we've been praying about, and we've been wanting to know on this night. And we say these things in Jesus' name. Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. All right. So, man, I was just uh, sitting back the other day just thinking, man. I was just, I, I'm a big thinker. Man, I was, I was looking at some, some pictures in high school. Uh, I was scrolling on Facebook and old memory pop up, me in high school with my boys. I said, oh, but I was small. I was looking small, look skinny. I don't know. I was looking at the pictures and it just brought flashbacks because uh, the boys that I used to hang out with, man, we used to ride whips, you know what I'm saying, cars together. And so, man, it, it brought me back to my first car. I remember my first car. Uh, it was an old 1992 Buick Century. <laughs> 1990, it was a uh, black, it was like a blueberry color. Anybody remember y'all first car? <laughs> man, I was laughing, man. I said, I used to go everywhere with that car. Look, I bought that car. Uh, I, I remember, I don't know my mom don't remember. They say, uh, I had asked him. I said, man, when y'all go buy me a car? And uh, they say, boy, after you graduate, 
And so I say, oh, man, I quit the basketball team. I say, I'm going to work. And so I started saving my little money. I bought my first little car. So I was excited. Rode that car everywhere, Baton Rouge. I rode that car till the wheels fall off, man. <laughs> and so I love my little car. It just brought back memories. But, I, but my next car that I had, that's the car I fell in love with. I had a, uh, a, um, a Lincoln Town Car Signature. It was like a pearl blue. I cherished that thing, had the leather tan seats inside. Man, I fell in love with that car. Man, that car was, it was way bigger than my first car. I thought, I'm talking about it, look, it was an eight, a V8. I was ready to smash the gas on that car. Look, fixed it up, put some, some big rim screen TVs. But I was so excited for that car right there. First car, I, I said, oh, that was a blessing. But my second car, I said, true, boy, I'm ready to ride that. So I couldn't wait to get on the road. I said, man, I want to mash this gas. I said, I want, I want to see how fast this car go. Because on the, on the speed thing, it said it go up to 140, I think. 140? I said, I'm about to mash the gas. Watch when I hit the highway. Got the car, got it approved, everything. Man, I, I got on the highway. Man, I said, all right, let's get it. My other car didn't do that. My other car went up to like 70 and they just started shaking. <laughs> I said, oh man. So I had to ride on the highway at 70. I said, well, I'll get what I gotta get. But this car, this car was smooth, man. It had airbags and everything on that. So I hit the gas. I said, man, I'm about to do 100 something. Now I'm young. So I hit the gas. Gas went to about 60 miles per hour. About, within 10 seconds, it was at 60 miles per hour. Hit the gas. Went to 60, then I went to 65, 70, 80, went to 90, went to 95, then went to 90, then went to 80, <laughs> went back to 70, and I say, oh man, this thing fast. I got scared, man. I started easing up and I started letting go. And, 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 and it's funny. It's funny right now, but the truth of the matter is, the sad truth is that we might, we, 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 we are in a place like that in life. I believe we are in a place like that in life. I believe, like my old Lincoln, God has created us to do much more and many of us to accomplish in life, for many of us to accomplish in life. And I believe God has not only created us with the capacity for greatness, but along on our journey of life, he has given us opportunities for greatness and for us to walk in purpose and fulfill the assignment in our lives. But we are afraid to mash the gas. We're afraid to go out. I'm going to break it down for y'all. But so many people in life, they get to 90 and 95 and have never stepped on the gas of possibility and potential of who God has created and called us to be. And we miss out and don't achieve the full possibilities that God has for us. And so I have a question to ask us tonight. I made a joke about my car and I was scared. I, I, I didn't want to go that fast. I got to a place I was bucked. We can get like that. We can get so excited. We can see the dream. We can see what we want to do. But when we get to the, a certain level, a certain place, we start slowing down. We give up. We don't do what we intended to want to do. And so I have a question to ask us tonight. When we come to the end of our life, old and gray, law willing, when you come to the end, would you rather regret the things you did or the things you didn't do? Think about it. All of us have a list of the things that we regret. We all regret some things, that, some mistakes and some things we did in life. Mistakes you've made, errors you committed, people you hooked up with. Come on. All of us will have a list of regrets. But the good news about regrets is what the things that we've done, God has something for that. The Bible says he gives us mercy. The Bible says that he gives us grace. The Bible says he loves us anyway. And he loves us so much that he gives us another chance to where he forgives us of our sins and he washes us of the blood. So we all have areas in our life that we made mistakes and when we regret, God covers it with the blood of Jesus. Mercy, forgiveness. So even if you regret something you've done, you don't have to think about it too long because it's under the blood of Jesus. You're forgiven. 
His grace is made sufficient. But what medicine is there for missed opportunities? <laughs> what soothes and calms the regret of not having done what you know should have been done, could have been done, with the energy and the possibility that God created and gifted you with? Mm. It's a sad thing to come to the end of our lives and look back over our lives and regret what we should have done, what we could have done, and what we would have done if we just got ahead a chance, if we had time, or if we could have stepped on the gas and maximized the moments of our life. What do we do when we miss the best years of our life as though it were? Ooh, say, boy, Brian, your last word was, was hard. Now you're on us again. Hey, but look, think about it. God did not create us just to simply exist. Really? God did not shape you in your mother's womb to simply just let life happen to you. God did not breathe life into you and wake you up this morning for you to just sit and watch other people pursue their dreams and achieve greatness in their lives. He never created you just to be, watch other people be successful. God has a plan for your life as well. You, but sometimes we can get so caught up in a place where we're serving and we and we and we we helping other people dreams come true. But you have dreams and you have things in your heart that God placed in your heart, but you don't press you don't match the gas in that area. So God did not anoint you to be a bystander in life. God's plan for your life did not come from the gospel of Otis Redden, Red, Redden where you, you were not created to sit down at the dock of the bay, wasting time. <laughs> Some old school got that one. God, God didn't ever attend to you to just stand there, sit down and waste time, waste your life, and waste opportunity, waste possibilities for you to strive to be great. God did not do that. And I believe God has big plans for all of us in here. The Bible says eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, all the things that he have in store for each and every one of us. God has major plans for each and every one of us. We all have a specific calling, a unique calling, a specific purpose that nobody else can do. And God wants to see that. He wants to see us walk in the purpose that he intended us to have. We all was destined to live at a level more than where we at. We always destined to live at a level better than what it is. We always destined to achieve more than you have right now. And now is your time. Now is the season for you to step on the gas of your life and see what God created you to be. See what God created you to be. You to be. Amen. Yes. Because if you look at people who step on the gas in life and who maximize any possibilities, it's not a lot, and I'm not talking about financial and, and professional. I'm talking, but people who lived out their purpose, people who changed the world around them, people who done great things, we go find out that what distinguished them from others is not that they had some great gift. It's not that they had the best talent. It's not that they had a uh, financial background. It's not that they had the best schools, the best uh, family. It's not none of that. But what makes them different is they had a different mindset. They had a different attitude. They had a different spirit. So we're going to come right here and talk about a man, a brother by the name of Daniel. Anybody heard about the book of Daniel? A lot of us grew up. It don't matter what. You don't even have to be saved. Somebody heard about the, uh, the book of Daniel and him throwing in the lion's den. Some type of story or something about the book of Daniel. Well, let's talk about Daniel because Daniel had an excellent spirit. An excellent spirit. <laughs> so somewhere, let me give you a little context to give you a little idea of what's going on. A little summary. So somewhere in 50, uh, 587, 597 B.C., somewhere in between that, you're going to see Jerusalem and Israel was conquered and destroyed by the Babylonians under the leadership of Nebuchadnezzar. So they took the best of the best out of Israel. They wanted the best of them, captured them, and then they wanted to teach them their ways, teach them their culture so that they can put them in positions to work. And so they took them. And we all know what happened. 
They took, them, took their culture, used their gifts to contribute to the Babylonian Empire. They even changed their names. And some of these Hebrews, we all know them right now. We all heard of them. There was four of them that we, they talk about right here. We know Daniel. Who else we know? Shadrach, Meshach, and a bad Negro. Somebody said a bad Negro. <laughs> hey, man, a bad Negro. A bad Negro. I mean, it was a bad brother. And as we read about this journey of Babylonia, there was some distinguishing characteristics about them. Chapter 1, it talks about the Daniel fast. Daniel had three friends that did not eat the meat and eat the things that they, everybody else was eating. Daniel said, nah, I'm good. I'm going to take a, uh, a sweet potato sandwich <laughs> with a bottle of smart water. <laughs> Daniel said, we straight. So 10 days then passed, and they got stronger, they got healthier, they got wiser, they got better. The soldiers was looking at them all skeptical and like, man, what's going on with the ball, man, the ball? So that's when the king looked at them and he, he promoted them as top advisors. You look at it in chapter 2, I'm going to call him King Nebo. King Nebo had a wild dream. A wild, you, you ever had a dream that just woke you up in the middle of the night and you was like, what, what just happened? He had a wild dream that stressed him out, so he called his squad to try to explain it to him. They couldn't do it. And then so the king gets mad and he orders to execute all them ball. And so Daniel hears about it. He asks him, he asks him, he prays about it. He told his friends. Then God revealed, to, revealed the dream and the meaning to Daniel in a vision. Daniel goes to the king and explains the dream. It's about a huge statue representing different kingdoms with a rock smashing it and turning it into a mountain, showing God's eternal kingdom. The king was blown away, spares the wise men, and then guess what? He promotes Daniel and his friends to another high position. That's favor, huh? When we look at it in chapter 3, we find the famous story with the three Hebrew boys. We all know that story when it was thrown into the fire, thrown into the, thank you, Pop. Appreciate you, little man. All right. Oh, Lord, the words more. Thank you, though. Praise God. Holy Bible. And so we know about that story where Daniel was thrown into the fire. Uh, Daniel, Meshach, and his three boys, all his boys. And then they look into the fire. They seen a fourth figure in there. They say, wait. They seen a fourth man in there. And we believe that was Jesus. And so they were protected. They come out the fire. No smoke, no burn. Uh, probably still smell of cologne. Them boys had nothing. You couldn't even tell. They didn't even have no burn, no ashes, nothing on their shoes. They came out, no harm, clean. Then you see in chapter 4 and 5, King Nebo, we see King Nebo, he rise, he reign, and then he fallen. That's from chapter 1 to 4. Then we see there's another king shows up by Belshazzar, who rises and then fallen in chapter 5. And then in chapter 6, we now come to the third empire by the name of Darius. Hey, bro, don't look at me like that. Darius. <laughs> but the, the, the name Darius, though, and he, it means rich and rich and kingly. You remember that. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what we name him. And Darius, in an attempt to regain control of the empire, he assigns three governors. One of the governors of 120 was Daniel. Now, remember, Daniel is from Babylon. Babylon, not from Babylonia. Daniel is a Hebrew from Israel. Daniel did not go to the schools they went to. Daniel was not born in their elite families. Daniel did not have no financial backing. Daniel is an outsider who rises to the top, and the Bible says Darius wants to make him the ruler over everything. You see the life of Daniel. You see, because you see an excellent spirit. Daniel had an excellent spirit. It wasn't because Daniel had the gift of inter interpretation, getting it twisted up, interpretation. Yes, but in verse 3, the Bible, you see in verse 3, it says he distinguished himself because he had an excellent spirit in him. Somebody say an excellent spirit. An excellent spirit. What is an excellent spirit? All right. It's when you expect more of yourself than is required by others. I'm going to say that again. It's when you expect more of yourself than required by others. An excellent spirit is when you bring 110% of yourself to everything you connect to and commit yourself to do. 
an excellent spirit is when you set a standard to some things and it don't matter what they say. Every, you, you won't accept anything because your name is on it. When your name is on something, you don't just accept whatever it, they might say. You have values. You have a high standard. You set your standards high. That's an excellent spirit. And look, an excellent spirit is not about being, having a perfect spirit. No, no, no. Perfect and excellent is two different things. An excellent spirit is even if you fall and you don't meet the standards that you have set, you don't make no excuse. You don't blame other people for, work, for not working. Or, but you learn from the lesson and you do better the second time. That's an excellent. You, you improve. You get better. You recognize it. You don't play the blame game. Well, I would be great if they would allow me to come up. No, no, no. That's, that's not an excellent spirit. So in verse 3, the scripture we focus on the most, the Bible says Daniel distinguished himself with an excellent spirit. He chose to be different. Whatever Daniel had, everybody else around him didn't have it. <laughs> that spirit that, that was in Daniel was rare. And when you look around today, an excellent spirit is very rare. It's very rare. You put 10 people in a room, you might get two excellent spirits. Not everybody want to be excellent. Not everybody have an excellent spirit. Not everybody. And so everyone don't have a spirit of excellence. Not even just looking around, look in your family. Not everybody got an excellent spirit. Look on your job. Not everybody got an excellent spirit. Maybe the person next to you. No, I'm just playing. Don't, don't look at them. <laughs> Not everybody have an excellent spirit. So I want to talk about three sharp points on three enemies of an excellent spirit. Three enemies to an excellent spirit. Three enemies that's going to keep us from walking in excellence and maximizing our potential, maximizing our possibilities and gifts that God has given us. Three enemies. Y'all want to know them? Amen. And we're going to get out your way. Amen? Number one, the first enemy of an excellent spirit is entitlement. Ooh. Somebody say a sense of entitlement. What is entitlement? Well, it's when someone feels like they automatically deserve special treatment even if they haven't earned it. They just feel because they've been a part of an organization for a long time, they deserve the position. And they never even put the work in. A sense of an entitlement is when you feel something is due to you. Something is owed to you. Something is rightfully yours and it comes to you no matter what because who you are and what you are or what you have done, that's entitled. Y'all know people who, who have a sense of entitlement because they got the last name. That's their last name so they feel like this is my place. Maybe the money in the account, they got that, they balling, they got that money in the account so they feel they deserve what they got, because they got the money. You know those people, the people that got the title, they hold the title on the job so they feel like they got the right to have what they have. Because how long, or oh, a person, I said it early, a person that's a part of an organization, they think just because they've been a part of the organization for a long time, they deserve it. Because of all that they contribute, all that they put in. The problem with having a sense of entitlement is when you, got, when you get to that place, you believe that something or someone owes you more than you owe it. That's when you get, so for example, <clears throat> I'm gonna break it down like this. Let's look at it from the scriptures. Daniel was not from Babylon. Daniel was an outsider. And the reason why some of them, reason why they hated Daniel is because Daniel got a position that they wanted. So Daniel was raised up above them 
And they felt like, man, we went to the best schools. We was out here. We did all of these things. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't study the best work. We, we from here, man. How can Daniel get to this place? How can y'all promote Daniel into this place? That's why they hated him. That's why they, they didn't like Daniel. They had a problem with Daniel because Daniel had a spirit of excellence. And the kings that they were under seen that and promoted them because of the spirit of excellence. It was like, man, he an outsider, man. He don't deserve it. He don't have the rankings like we do. They felt because he didn't have, they didn't have the, his experience, the experiences, he didn't deserve what he had. Yes, so if we look at the life of Daniel, the life of Daniel teaches us that a spirit of excellence would take you further than a sense of entitlement. A spirit of excellence would take you higher than a sense of entitlement. Your attitude, your energy, the energy you bring, the excellence you commit to will take you higher than what is written on your resume. It don't matter what you got on your resume. It don't matter how much college degrees, how much uh, 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 work you've done, how much experience you've done. When you operate in a spirit of excellence, it can take you higher than a place of a person that's been in in that place for years. That's just, we don't serve a fair God. Sometimes we say things like, God is not fair. See, the way we think of things in life, we look at, we put God how we think God should be. But God don't, we don't serve a fair God. We should thank God for, for, for his mercy. We should thank God for his grace. Thank God for giving us another chance because if God was fair, we would get what we deserve. So sometimes God chooses and if he see fit that somebody has an excellent spirit, don't be hurt because he wants to put you in a place that you deserve to be in because you come with an excellent spirit. He don't care about entitlement. He don't care about all that stuff. We care about that because Sometimes when you have a sense of entitlement, you can get to a place where you get complacent, you get comfortable. You're so focused on your past progress. You talk about the things you used to do and what God used to do, and you get comfortable in that place of, of uh, where God, oh God, you, God used to, man, God had made a way, but is God still making way? Like, like you get to a place where you're too comfortable. And now somebody that have what you should be doing, you get mad. Sometimes <laughs> entitlement, man, I'm telling you, entitlement is, excellence is a threat to entitlement. Like, it's a threat. It threats it. When people see, I'm getting too excited right now. <laughs> Say, let me leave that notebook. So, so, yes, because entitlement is threatened by excellence. Enti they hated Daniel because he had an excellent spirit. And whenever a person is operating in, in the entitled, when he sees somebody operating in excellence, it reminds them of what they should have been doing. <laughs> people who are entitled feel threatened by people who have an excellent spirit. That's why your coworker hates you. Come on, y'all. Some of y'all thinking right now, he was just sick. I was just thinking about that coworker. That's why they don't like you. You ain't did, you didn't even do nothing to him. It's because you come on the job and you work. Excellence. You do your best. That's why your supervisor won't promote you. You ain't never did nothing to him. And title people don't like when people, they don't like people with an excellent spirit. Another thing about entitlement is that, let me see. Another thing about entitlement is that sometimes people come to a place where they get so comfortable and they feel like you, you got to a place where you didn't work, work, work. Yeah, you might have started off working, doing your thing to get to where you got to get. But when you get so caught up and so comfortable in the job or so comfortable doing what you do, you can come to a place where you don't strive for excellence. See, excellence is not, it's not, it's something, it's who you are. Excellence is who you are. It's not just something you just do. 
when you look at stuff, you look at it from a, a, a mind pers a perspective of excellence. And so that's one thing that threatens entitlement. A person that is striving in excellence. A person that wants to be great. Somebody say an excellent spirit. We're going to break the mold tonight. Amen? Amen. 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 So yes, entitlement, a sense of entitlement. Let us examine our hearts and make sure we're not in that place where we feel like we deserve what we got. Because God can take away all the things that we have and, and, and what you're going to say now. Be grateful for where you're at and work hard. Amen. Be grateful for the place God have you. I just want to challenge you tonight. Just, just work hard. Be better. Don't feel... Don't get mad because the person that you hire or the person that you work with or the person, family member or brother or sister, I don't know what it is, but don't get mad at them. Just work hard. Do, do it with an excellent spirit. Ask, the God, ask God to give you an excellent spirit. My second point that I want to talk about is not only sense of entitlement is an enemy to excellence, but Number two, a lack of vision. A lack of vision is an enemy to entitlement. I mean, into an uh, excellent spirit. A lack of vision. A lack of vision will always be the enemy of an excellent spirit. About the time we get to chapter six, remember this. It's the third empire Daniel had to deal with. It's the third one. Nebuchadnezzar came. He failed. Belshazzar came. He failed. Now we got Darius. Think about it. And it could be possible for Daniel to look at how many times these empires have failed and excuse himself from bringing excellence with Darius because he's seen that the thing doesn't work anyway. He's seen Nebuchadnezzar fail. He's seen Belshazzar fail. Nah. Darius going to fail too. So why bring excellence to something I'm in if I automatically see it as a failure? You see the problem? Then you could have. But look at it this way. It's crazy because so many people in life never accelerate, never maximize what they could be because they look at what they committed to and they lack vision of its possibility and then say, why should I give my best? Why should I commit to this? Why should I do my best on this job? Why should I care about this program? Nobody else does. Why should I give my all to this ministry? Ain't nobody showing up anyway. Ooh, I know it's quiet. Why should I come to rehearsal? They didn't come. Oh, <laughs> that's somebody else. <laughs> we say things like that. We, look, people look at something and make a decision whether they're going to give their best to it or not. Why is that? Why we choose on what we want to be excellent in? Why do we look at a situation and if it's small, we choose, mm, I'm not, it don't deserve excellent. That's, that's small. Why do we do that? Now the sad thing in life, a lot of people will only bring excellence to something they feel big, that feel large, that feel seen. Some people want to be seen. So now they're going to be excellent in something that people go recognize them do. Oh, now I'm squeezing, now I'm touching some toe. If it's small, you won't do your best. Nobody sees it. Nobody knows. They won't recognize you. But if it's big, you in front of people, you will give your best to be recognized Give credit for X because they will give you credit for the excellence that you brought. But the problem with this is excellent doesn't require recognition. Being excellent doesn't require being recognized. Excellence is its own reward. <laughs> man, look, bro, I didn't, man, I'm telling you, bro. I got a lot of information, so I don't want to uh, just go over my head. So a spirit of excellence says this. 
I'm going to give my best to something, not because I need to be recognized, not because I need my name to be called, not because I'm looking for attention, but I'm going to give my best to it because I know the impact of my excellence. And if I give it my best, it won't be small for long. <laughs> can, can I pause and give y'all my mindset? This is my mind. This is, I'm, you have to believe that about yourself. Ain't nothing wrong with that. Do we believe that about ourselves? Do we have the vision to see that it don't matter if it's small, big, if I'm a part of it, it's gonna prosper. If I connect to it, it's gonna grow. But a lot of us don't have that mindset. We just get in the circle, whatever y'all need. We have that mindset, it, it, whatever. But what, what, what can you contribute? What can you do? You have excellence. Do you believe you have that excellent spirit in you? I believe it. It don't matter what you put me in, something go shake. If you give me a piece of bread, a piece of meat, and some cheese or something, I'ma look at it and be like, man, we gotta eat some kind of way. Then you got a, a group of people like, well, we don't have enough and we gonna need some, they will sit there the whole time starving. Man, look at the problem, come up with the vision, all right, contribute, lay out the plan. That, that, Daniel, had an ex, Daniel had a vision. Somebody say, Daniel had a vision. People with an excellent spirit says, I want to join because I want to add to it. I want to bring excellence to it. The Bible says in uh, Zechariah 4.10, do not despise these small beginnings. Just because something is small now, if you bring an excellent spirit to it, it won't be small for long. If you bring an excellent spirit to your job, it won't be, it, you won't be there for long. You're going to get promoted or something. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Let me tell y'all something, bro. <clears throat> I'm going to give y'all a testimony. I've been working, I, I was working the subway, champagne for, I started off as a bag boy. Because then I got saved, I started coming here. And after I got saved, man, God just sparked a fire. I took my work ethic to another level, uh, <clears throat> knowing who I was and studying the word on the pastor. And so I was working as a bag boy, man, and because, the, because of the faith in, in, in me working in excellence, man, it promoted me even if I, would, I wouldn't try it. My mindset is I don't never try to be promoted. You know how you got people that say, uh, they come up to you, ask for raises, they, they want to be promoted. Hey, I'm going to be a supervisor. I'm going, I, that was never my intention. I just show, I let my actions speak. I let my action speak. <clears throat> and so I work, work behind the scene. Don't look for no attention. Don't look for no raise. Never ask for a raise. Never. I work. I let my work. I let my service. I let my, my, my attitude speak. Promotion. Here. Manager. Assistant manager. Then I was this close to getting my own subway, but the Lord called me another direction. But... Everything you touch, everything you're a part of, it grows. Yes, sir. It grows because you got vision. You see it turning out well. You see it coming out. You see it being successful. You see the business, business growing. You see the sales going up. You see the customers leaving happy. You see, when you see it, it's going to happen. And you operate in it, it's going to happen. But a lot of times we don't see it. We don't have no vision. We just, we just go along with the flow. But my question is, do you add value to the people you, you around, to the people you connect, to the ministry you in? When they see you, do they be like, oh, Lord, are you just wasted space? Or you really come into the circle to add? Lord. Do you come in to add? Do you come in to add? Because look. And it don't matter who your boss is. Look at it. Let's read it. Daniel said, Daniel gave his all to Nebuchadnezzar. Yes, sir. <laughs> Daniel gave his all to Belshazzar. Yes, sir. And he gives his all to Darius. Yes. Because Daniel understood excellent does not have an on and off switch. <laughs> Daniel realized excellent is not on and off. You just cut it off and cut it on based on 
who, if they treating you right, then you go give them excellence. Let me tell you, son, that was moments where my boss, Mr. Champagne, used to come in there and go off on me. But that don't mean I stop my work and I just, well, he don't, he, no, excellence. You still work at excellence because the scripture that stuck, we work unto the Lord and not unto man. Yes, when you get that, yes, you're not working for him anyway. You're working to please God. You, you, he's the promoter. He's the one that blesses you. He's the one that lift you. He's the one that blesses you financially. He's the one. So it don't matter if I'm there or picking cans or yes, sir. if my focus is to be excellent in what I do, it's go prosper. That's my test. It's go prosper. It's going to prosper. And Daniel understood that. It doesn't matter who's in leadership. Who's your boss? Excellent is not what you choose to do, but excellent is who you are, who I am. Excellent is about doing your best, your very best, and always trying to improve even if things aren't perfect. Do you believe that tonight? Amen. We don't believe that about ourselves, man. We really don't. The Bible says, let everything we touch be blessed. Do you believe everything you touch is blessed? Because if you go into it, oh, I don't want to touch it because I'm going to break it. Your, our mind, it starts a different mindset, different spirit. Different spirit. It's the attitude that says, if I'm a part of it, it's going to grow. Everything you are part of. You bring excellence to it because it's who you are. Somebody say excellence is who I am. Last point. Last point. Daniel had a vision, man. Not only entitlement is an enemy of excellence, not only a lack of vision, not having a vision is an enemy of excellence. But the last one. <clears throat> I believe this is, I believe this is real, right, y'all? The last one. Okay, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Oh, I skipped some part, but that's good. We're going to keep it going. Another one is, number three, a satisfied, you're satisfied with mediocrity. Satisfied, you complacent with mediocrity. Mediocrity, somebody said, so I heard somebody say this, mediocrity is the eternal enemy of excellence. What made these men mad at Daniel? They were content with just enough. They was happy with just enough. And y'all be surprised at how many people in life are satisfied with just enough. <laughs> oh, yeah. Somewhere in life, the enemy gets us to a place to try to believe, and he tried to invade us with mediocrity. He tried to attack us with this. And like I remember one time, my son, BJ, <clears throat> he came home with his report card, and he was excited, you know what I'm saying? Uh, praise God, my kid's doing great. But um, he came back, and he was like, Daddy, look, look, my report card. Look, I got a C. And I'm like... I say, oh, all right, that's good. But I say, son, you can do better than that. That's average. I say, that's good. You remember that part? He said, look, I got a C. I'm glad you picked it up. You got a C. But that's, that's not the best you can do. Don't be too excited about being average. Because God never called us to be average. He called us to be excellence. It's a calling. As believers, it is our job as believers to set the standard. For the world, man. When the, when the people in the world, when the lost look at us, do they look at excellence? Or do they look at the okay, average? We're not, we're not called to be average. We're not called to be average. So, you know, some of y'all know people like that in y'all life. They show up just enough to not be cut. <laughs> oh, look, I'm going to be cut. <laughs> Come on, Kendrick, I hear that show. Look, oh, I just made it. I'm going to be cut. Come on. They give just enough to keep their name on it. Oh, look at her, $20. Just so their name can be, oh, I can't, 
The thing was $1,000, put a little 20 Yeah, I got my name on it. Just enough. They're not really trying to be, you know what I'm saying? Y'all know people like that. I'm telling you, just enough to get by. How many to say? Just to get by. That's why they are angry with Daniel, because Daniel was raising the bar. Daniel was breaking the mold. Daniel was just, look, he, Daniel was, look, just, Daniel was like, just enough is never enough. It's not enough. Good enough is not good enough. It's not good enough. That should never be our mindset. Oh, that's good enough. No. Is it right? Is it complete? Is it done? Now, I'm not talking about perfection. We all gonna make mistakes. But I'm talking about, do you pay attention to the details? Do you see if it's placed right? You know what I'm saying? Do you put it back in place? I'm talking about stuff like that because when we operate in the spirit of exodus, it saves us from a lot of trouble. It, it saves us from coming back over ourselves and, and, and trying to explain things. Do it right the first time. Now, we're not perfect, but when you really, when your boss or somebody tell you it wasn't right, you come back and fix it. Now it's excellent, but it's not with an attitude that say, oh, that should be good. That's good. Leave it like that. Oh, no, nobody want to work. Oh, that, that's good. It's going to work. The screw everything loose? Oh, no, man. <laughs> and then three years later, it popped. Oh, man, I, I thought it was good. Uh, I thought it was good. Oh, man. So anyway, excellence. Our job is to be excellent and not good. To be excellent and not good. Let me give you all some examples. Good says, if you look at it from customer service perspective, good says, they says, this is basic. Let's look at it from a subway perspective. Good is, when a person walks in the restaurant, you take their order, what kind of bread, can you, what kind of bread would you like? All right, you make their sound, you listen to them, they tell you everything. They're they, they looking at, they're they trying to figure out what they want. You're looking at them and you, you're, doing your, you're doing good. You ring them up, you come, and you tell them, have a good day. That's good, because you did your job. Good is doing your job. But excellent says, when the customer walks in, welcome to Subway. How can I help you? Thank you for coming. And then you, come, you be like, all right, they tell you the sandwich. And then you be like, OK, they want a chicken sandwich. Would you like bacon on it for 50 cents extra? It tastes really good with bacon. Would you like it toasted? Yes. And then you slide it, then, ooh, bell peppers would really be good on this. Is it Philly cheesesteak? I'm telling you, when you toast it, excellence. And you do it in timing. You get to the register. Look, if you, sign, if you circle the end of this survey, you can win a free sandwich. Thank you. And look, matter of fact, give us feedback and let us know how our service was. Thank you so much. Be blessed. That's excellence. That's what we were called to do, be excellent, not just good. Oh, I didn't do nothing. But you, you, you come on, y'all know them places y'all go to. Man, why they look like they mad? They working there just because it's a job, but they don't really do it because, come on, man. And then now, how y'all feel after that? They, it was good, but you're still like, hmm, something missing. But you got that person that, that, right when you walk in the door, I know what you want. You want a roast beef? And you be like, man, they know my sandwich. And now you, you find yourself with that three days a week. <laughs> because it's, ex, it's an excellent spirit, it's attractive. People love being around a person that operates in excellence. If you're operating in excellence, it attracts. People want to know what you got. They want to be like that. They want that. So if you notice you don't have no friends, something's something not right. Yes, nobody want to talk to you, think about that. If nobody come up to you, ask you questions, sit down and listen to when you speak, yes, watch you work, compliment, compliment. If you ain't getting no compliments, if you ain't getting no encouragement, man, I like, you might not be, you might not have an excellent spirit. Real talk. Because an excellent spirit go draw, to, that's why Daniel then was promoted, because he's seen something. And it's not that Daniel was trying to be recognized. It's just when your mind is made up to be excellent, no matter what you're a part of, people go recognize it. It's going to be seen. You cannot ignore excellence. Now, you can ignore average. You'd be like, I don't even remember if I seen them. Because they didn't stand, they didn't do nothing. <laughs> so, so, yes, that's excellent. When it comes to exercising, come on, my mom is a great, my mom is a great example of excellence. 
She does everything in excellence. I hear people come up to me, oh, boy, you should have seen your mama, boy. She was little, she was doing them little things. And I'm like, oh, man, I'm going to have to go. Look, she does everything in excellence. She works out, she, the technique, everything is in excellence. The move, they look up, man, Miss Carol, she got a personal trainer's license, everything. I'm putting all her business out. She's like, man, why you keep talking about me? But it's excellence. But this is what good is. Good is, you know, I went to the gym. That's good. You went to the gym. You did more than a lot of people. I went to the gym. That's good. But look, you, when you train, it's not, you train just enough to participate. <laughs> you know, I went to the gym. You participate, and that's good. But excellence says, I'm going to be consistent. I'm going to be dedicated. I'm going to excel. I want to, I'm going to work, I want to see results. Excellence says, I'm going to work this thing until I see results, until I reach the goal. I have a vision. I want to see this happen. I'm not just doing this just because I want to be, I want to go with it. You're wasting your time if you're just going just to do it. I want people see that. When they see me at the gym, they be like, man, I see the difference. Oh, man. I'm just here. You know what I'm saying? I'm working. I'm doing my thing. I follow my plans. I follow my chest and track. It got to be consistent, not just a spontaneous, oh, if it work, it work. No, you got to, excellence is order, vision. We are what we repeatedly do. So excellence then is not an act, but it's a habit. It's a habit. Excellence is a habit. It's something you, it's, it's who you are. God does not want us to be average. Mediocrity is not in God's vocabulary. That's not in his vocabulary. What is mediocrity? Normal, a lack of inspiration, being average, settling for less, failing to strive for, ex for excellence, failing to meet high standards or expectations. Another one, my grandma used to say it all the time. She said it like this, you know, uh, yeah, you don't wanna do that half way. Don't do that half way. What y'all laughing at? I say halfway. <laughs> when you do things, don't do it half. Wait. And so, you never know, you never known God to be a half, halfway anything. Think about it. When God woke you up, he woke you up halfway? Well, some of y'all were still half asleep, but <laughs> he didn't wake you up halfway, half of you sleeping. No, he woke you up. God didn't halfway answer your prayers. He answered the whole prayer. God is not a halfway type of God. God didn't halfway bless you. But God does exceedingly, abundantly, above all we hope, acts or imagine. He does more than enough. Forever enough. More than enough. He is not a mediocre God. He, he's not an average God. Matthew 5, 16, the musicians could come up. Matthew 5, 16, Jesus says this. And y'all know the scripture, let your light so shine before men. How much Mary? Before men, before women, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You see, let your light shine before men and women so that they may see your good works. Can I let y'all know that people see they watching you. They, they watch the way you work. They watch the way you live. They watch the way you talk. Don't just think, don't just think that you're just living your life and nobody watching you. They, they, even if they don't talk to you, they don't say hi, they don't do, they, they see. Trust me, they see. You know? And don't just be excellent only when they see. Sometimes, I ain't gonna lie, I bet you a lot of us have an excellent spirit at church. Yes, sir. Praise God, hallelujah, glory. You're excellent spirit at church. And when people see you at church, they say, you got an excellent spirit. But when they see you at Walmart, <laughs> that's why people leave church at. They, they, they keep confusing people. And I understand we're not perfect, but like, Excellent spirit should be our goal in everywhere, not just church. When you go to a family reunion, 
do they know you for accident spirit? Or you, they know you for being the same old, uh, same, same old person you used to be? Because you, you got an off and on switch. Oh, is the family union? I'm going to I'm going I'm going to I'm going to do my stuff. It's the family union. And, and, but I'm going to church tomorrow. That's not an excellent spirit. <laughs> oh, that's not an excellent spirit. That's a lukewarm spirit. <laughs> and so, so yeah, let our light shine because they see people are watching you. Your excellence can inspire and change somebody else's life. People see you don't only testify with what you say in preaching the gospel, but you testify by the way you live. You testify, you witness to people by the way you live. Are your works, the works that you do, is it pleasing to God? Your kids are watching you. When they see you, do they see excellent or do they see hypocrite? You know, your neighbors are watching, your family is watching you. Your coworkers are watching. When they see you, do they see hypocrite? Or do they see, man, that's, that man, that woman, they always work. They do everything in excellence. Business owners, I want to encourage every business owner, every supervisor, every manager, every leader, every parent, everybody that's in leadership role, I want to encourage you this, this evening. Lead by example. If you are in a leadership, if you're a believer, if you're a parent, if you, if you are in a leadership position, if you don't, if you're a mom or dad, that's leadership. Lead by example. Don't expect your kids to do something that you ain't doing. How you, you want your kids to do something, but they doing what they see. <clears throat> if you're a boss, don't expect your coworkers to work hard, but then you don't work hard. If you're a, a work, do the job, get it done. Y'all can stop playing, I'm sorry. And so, yes, there's a connection between the work you do and the glory God receives. There's a connection. We ought to do our work in a way that people would see how excellent God is and say, man, there's only God that allowed them to do that. So here's the question. The songwriter even says it. Do your works, do the works of your life. Glorify God. Do it speak. Do your work, do your work Monday through Friday, glorify God. Monday through Saturday, glorify God. Do you have an excellent spirit tonight? Now, if you want to do things in an excellent way, here's some homework for you to leave with tonight. It's Bible study, right? I can leave y'all some homework. Y'all want to know how an excellent spirit looks? All right, cool. Number one, set clear goals. Set clear goals. Don't just wake up and just hope that everything fall in place. Set clear goals. You'd be surprised how many lost people and believers wake up every day with no, with, with no goals. I'm just trying to live for God. But you don't have no goals? What, what, what are you trying to reach? What are you trying to accomplish? What are you, how far are you trying to go? What are you trying to see? Uh, uh, what are you trying to be productive in today? Not just play on phone for three hours, four hours. What are you trying to do? Like, what, what it is? And y'all can screen side because you can't commit yourself to 30 different things and expect excellence. Because some, somehow the devil, this is what the devil wants us to believe. He wants us to believe that being busy is being important. The more busy we are, that's the more we, we, we excellent, we, we getting things done. But no, 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 that's a trick of the enemy to get you busy, 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 busy. You can't be excellent being busy. You have to set a goal, a clear goal, and maximize and attack it. So I would encourage you to set some things that you really want to do and go for it. It can be a few, four, five, whatever. If you can do it in excellence, go for it. But I promise you, if you got 30 things, they all, they're not go, all of them not going to be in excellence. I'm telling you. Another one, plan truly. Plan. Working out, meal plans, work, finance, plan, plan through. Planning is good. Now, sometimes God might change up some things, but at least you got something to work with. You planned it out. This is excellence. Planning. Pay, I even put, this is my points. I, I pay attention to details. You know what I'm saying? It's like me putting, like, yeah, man, oh, yeah. I put my phone down right here, but I'm not looking. I'm like, 
Pay attention to where you put your phone, like details. You know what I'm saying? You gonna pick my phone up, probably. <laughs> so, pay attention to details because that's a, that's a place. It's, you go learn. You go if you fix something and you put some. Look at it before you leave. Sometimes you put stuff down and you just like pay attention. It's, you don't have to be in a rush. Your brother call no maintenance man. Put it there and look at it. Vision. Okay, it's set right. Excellent. So you won't have to come back and do it again. Plan. Pay attention. Another one. Continue to learn. Don't think that you learn. You know it all. Don't think that you got everything down packed. Continue to learn. Always have room to grow. Always. It don't matter how long you've been saved, how long you know your Bible, we all have room to grow. Don't think you know it all, because if you think you know it all, you're not gonna have an excellent spirit. Because you feel like you got an excellent spirit and everybody around you are not an excellent spirit. <laughs> but you think you got it because you know your Bible, you know your scriptures, but you're still going off on people. Continue to learn. Another one, I would encourage us to stay organized. Excellence is being organized. You got things all over the place. All over the place. Things all over. You got this, that. You eat a piece of, piece of candy, you leave the wrap on the floor. That bothers certain people's spirit. You're like, oh, what are you doing? Clean up after you. Pick up. <laughs> if, I, if I, man, look. I come a long way. I ain't even gonna say that. <laughs> so yeah, stay organized. Another one that I like, some people, ask for feedback. It's okay, I think being in the customer service, feedback is good, you know why? Because you get, you get the experience of the customer, you get the experience of the person you talk to. When, when you get feedback, how, how you think I've been going? Give feedback, get feedback from people, because you know what, that helps you grow. Don't be afraid to ask people, how you doing? Go to your boss, how have I been? How have my work been lately? Is there anything that you see I need to be better in? It's okay, don't think you know it all. Get feedback. <clears throat> that helps us stay on point, amen? amen. <clears throat> so prioritize what you committed to, bring excellence to it, bring excellence to it, and allow the work that you do bring glory to God. Here's the question that I started off with, and I'm going to ask you again. Do you have an excellent spirit? Let's pray. Father God, we come before you tonight, God. Most high God, we, as we think about the word, and Father God, help us to have an excellent spirit in all that we do. Teach us how to operate in excellence. Not only when they're watching, but in secret. In our prayer time, as we study the word, with our families, on our jobs, in our church, in our city, in our community. Help us to walk and be an example in excellence, God. I know we can't do all of them in excellence, but we make a decision tonight to whatever we commit to, that we're going to give it our best, our all, so that our works can bring you glory. God, we want to just make your name look great. We want to be an example. We want to be encouraging. We want to add value to whatever we connect to, whatever we are part of, God. Let us, give us vision, Lord God, to see the potential, to see it coming out and working out well, God. Whatever we are put our hands on, whatever we attach to, whatever we, we do, God, let it be done in excellence, Lord God. Be with us, God. Give us an excellent spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus name. Amen. Give God some glory. Amen. Hallelujah. So we talked about living with an excellent spirit. And if you look at the life of Jesus, no greater example than Jesus. He lived the ultimate, he, had, he was the ultimate example of excellence. Excellent service, excellent compassion, excellent sacrifice. He sacrificed, he, excellent love, excellent teaching, 
Everything he did, he did it in excellence. No greater example to follow. Daniel got his excellence from Yah. And he wants to give us that same spirit. How can we get the excellent spirit? Well, that excellent spirit only comes from an excellent God. If you want that spirit of excellence, all you have to do is ask God to give you that spirit. Ask God to come into your heart and fill your heart with a spirit of excellence to save your soul, to fill you up and give you the Holy Spirit to lead you into a spirit of excellence. God wants to give us an excellent spirit. Excellent spirit comes from God, but all we have to do is admit and accept it. It's available. We can't be excellent on our own. You can put your mind into it. You can put everything, your abilities, your skills, your talent, your gift. But the only thing that matters is the work that's done for Christ, the things you do for him. But you have to have him in order to be excellent. Because that's when your work won't go in vain. Like the songwriters say, let my work speak for me. Amen? And if you want your works to speak for you, we're going to say a simple prayer tonight. A prayer of salvation and a prayer of excellence. It's very simple as ABC. For those who have never heard the gospel in here tonight, very simple. We have to admit, look, God, we, we, we make mistakes. We, we cannot be excellent. We can... We're, we're not perfect. We didn't messed up plenty of times, God. You, you know that, God. I know. I, I can't do. I can't do it even if I try. I can't make it on my own. When you realize that and you admit that and you say, God, I'm in need of a savior. I do admit. The Bible says that we all fall short of the glory of God. None of us are perfect. Our righteousness is like filthy rags. But thank God for His righteousness, His imputed righteousness that he wants to give us so that we can do what's right. But then we have to believe. We admit, we know we're wrong, we know we're not perfect. Now we believe. Believe what? Believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross. Believe that he loved us so much that he demonstrated his love for us so that we can have life, so that we can live life more abundantly, so that we can live a life in excellence. He died on the cross. He sacrificed, he took our place, that our punishment, he paid our ransom so that we can live and enjoy the life that he has given us. All we have to do is believe, believe in the cross, believe that he died, he rose. Open up your Bible and study the word. It's going to speak to you. You're going to see all the things he's done. Believe in the word of God. And last but not least, see, confess. Confess what? Confess that he is your Lord and Savior. Romans say we should not be ashamed of the gospel. Once God saved you and you believe and you confess and you realize the things God has done for you, then you confess, you let the family know, you let the world know that my God reigns, he rules, he's the Lord, <clears throat> he's the Lord of my life. When you do these things, God comes into your heart and the beginning of excellence starts. He's gonna show you some things. He's going to be with you. He's going to give you wisdom beyond your years. He's going to show you some things that you, you never could figure out because you have an excellent spirit in you. If you want that tonight, repeat after me. Say, Most High God, here I am, just the way I am. God, I need you. I fall short, God. I make mistakes. I messed up. I want to be excellent. I want to be like you. You are the great example. Help me in the areas that I fall weak in. God, you said that if I believe you, you will come into my heart. Lead me and guide me. Show me the way. Well, today, God, I do believe. I do believe that you died on the cross for my sins. You paid the ransom for my life. And I admit 
that I couldn't do it. No matter what I did, I always fall. But I thank you that you picked me up. God, and I pray that you would fill my heart with your love, with your excellence. I want to do what you do. Creating me a clean heart and renewing me a righteous spirit. Help me to live by example on my job, with my family, my friends, business, ministry, as a father, as a mother, as a child of God. I do confess, God, that you are my Lord. You are my Savior. Rule and reign in my heart this day forward, God. Thank you for saving my soul and giving me an excellent spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen. Give God some glory tonight. Hallelujah. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. I'm going to pray the benediction. Most high God, I just thank you for every person here tonight. I pray that you would bless them, keep them, shine your face upon them, give them traveling grace. I pray that everything they touch be a blessing, God. Every person they connect with, they encourage, there will be light, there will be salt in the earth, Lord God. Let us be a blessing to others. Give us peace in our homes tonight. God, we pray that you even bless the meal we go eat tonight, God. Let everything we do be a blessing tonight. Let us uh, leave out of here, Lord God striving to be better and to be more like you, God. We thank you. We pray that you bless our pastor. Keep him and his family, Lord God, as they get ready for Dallas, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Love y'all. Y'all have a great night. Y'all be blessed.